Hello, everybody. This is Austin Carr. Thank you for joining us again on another episode of the GreenLink podcast, where we talk all things energy, energy efficiency, and renewable energy. And today we are joined by GreenLink's technical engineer, Mr. Jacob Heinberg. Jacob, thank you for joining today. Yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah, we've been uh, excited about having you uh, on the show. We've talked about it a little bit off and on over the last several weeks. And in fact, when I first started thinking about doing a podcast, I was like, Jacob's the guy we need to have on there. He's got uh, all the brain power of the things that we do on the solar side. And uh, so this is going to be an exciting episode today. Um, yeah, I'm excited to be here. So. Yeah, yeah, it's good. And this is your first podcast, right? Yeah. Yeah, it's, uh, yep. it's a little different feel here having the voice in your head as, as we're going through it. But uh, it's uh, when it's all said and done, I think you'll have a good time today. But uh, anyway, so yeah. let's uh, start off talking a little bit about some of your background. You know, you started at GreenLink. It's been two years or so now, maybe? I think I'm going about almost two and a half years. Two and now, a half years? So. Okay. Yeah, yeah. went by so fast. Time is definitely flying. There's no doubt about that. Oh, yeah. Uh, but yeah, maybe you can talk to us a little bit about, you know, where you went to school and some of your background educationally and what are the things you've done that led you to the point where you are now at GreenLink. Okay, yeah, sure. So um, start off as kind of funny, I'm actually a mechanical engineer, so I did not start out in electrical stuff. Um, but uh, I, I went to Iowa State, got my mechanical engineering degree, yeah. and that's where I joined a, a solar car team. That's right. And I originally joined there because I you know, thought it was cool. We're building stuff out of carbon fiber. We're you know, making the car literally was you know, ran by solar power. Wow. So that's kind of what got me into like EVs and chargers and like just all the renewable stuff there. Yeah. So, so so it's not just that that was an EV. It was totally powered by the solar panels that you guys had installed on the on the car. Is that right? Uh yeah, so basically um so there is a battery. It's still got electric motors, sure. it's got a battery. Yep. Um and the team was called Team Prism. So Okay. Um basically how how it starts it's it's an actual like like a strategy race. Like uh Okay. So there's every year there's a track race. Every other year that track race is followed by a uh, cross country race. Like actually oh, wow. on the roads in a convoy, yeah. you're doing checkpoints, and um, basically the car you have a battery. You start with a full charge, but from that okay. point on, you're only uh, charging off the sun. Wow. So, okay. And yeah, like we had a car that could we could go 45 miles an hour if we had peak sun, yep. and that was net zero. We were pulling nothing from the battery. Wow. And just cruising. So, That's way better than I would have expected. Yeah. Holy smokes. Yeah, they were pretty lightweight cars. That was a single sure. seater. But okay. It, it was it was pretty interesting. I mean, you you'll have uh, you'll have guys that are in the, the lead car. Yep. And the lead car and the solar car they're legally one one vehicle. Okay. So they have to go through stop signs together and everything. Sure. Kind of going through traffic. Um, behind you got a chase van. They're running telemetry on the battery cells. You got guys watching the weather, figuring out like, okay, we want to burn the battery up a little more here. We want to okay. like slow down. It's going to be cloudy. Like, yeah. Trying to listen to the radios, what the other teams are doing. So, sure. Yeah. Wow, there's was, a lot that goes into that. Then. Yeah. It was it was a whole uh, a whole technical world. There yeah, yeah that, I imagine. So. Okay. But, Very cool. Uh, it, I got a question about that. So, what kind of wattage panel, or what were you? What did you use to power the vehicle? Obviously, you said, you said a solar panel, but. How many watts were you? So we actually got the uh, we had the actual cells themselves, like the the, the crystals it. you would okay. have in a solar panel. Sure. And there was a guy who he's actually one of the judges for for the race. Okay. And he he was one of the only guys in the world that had this process where he basically it, he would laminate the cells because obviously the stuff we install in a house is is heavy. It's actual right. glass. This yeah. was like a, a polymer film. Okay. And we had, our array was about twelve hundred watts. Got it. And it was it like siliconed to the car. And hmm. you're you're limited by like down to the square millimeter, a certain area of panels. And every year okay. they decrease that to make it more and more challenging. Got it. Okay. So, so you can't just fill up all the real estate that you have on the vehicle. You they have a set amount and they say this is the space you have and you've got to get the maximum yes. input out of it. Yep. Okay. And there was there was silicon cells had a certain amount and then the gallium cells, which are the little more uh more efficient ones they had a okay. smaller number. So you could kind of pick in the design stage, you know, what strategy yeah. you wanted to go with. Yeah. But yeah, it was it's it's kind of like laminating a potato chip without cracking it. Sure. And it's, okay. Yeah. So <laughs> very interesting. So after uh, after you graduated school, what was uh, what was your next stop in your journey from there? Um. So I I did a little bit of design work at at Bun, like making coffee makers, okay. uh, yeah. slushy machines, sure. things like that. Yeah. So got into uh, like three D modeling and okay. uh, parts and bill of materials that kind yeah. of stuff there. And then from there, I ended up at uh, Unicarriers, which is now. Now part of Mitsubishi Heavy Industries. 
Basically, okay. back in my hometown of Marengo, they're making uh, forklifts and automated automated forklifts, doing stuff in warehouses wow. and things now okay. too. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. Incorporating yeah. the AI and all the sensors and things yeah, like they were that, right? getting into some pretty cool stuff. So that okay. that was pretty interesting. And then um, basically, I, I got to a point where I found myself I, I wanted to get a little more hands on with stuff okay. because yeah. I, I found that a lot of this engineering stuff was was pushing me back into a desk again. Got it. And. Yep. Um, I, I wanted to, uh, I realized that and I liked being outside. Sure. So yeah. I was looking into like field engineering or there's all these like traveling service engineer type stuff. Mm-hmm. And um, then I was like, you know, like my parents had just done a solar system. I was reading all about got it. it. I got way, way too into it. I was yeah. looking at spreadsheets Imagine and things. You did. Yeah. And uh, I ended up just throwing my resume at an installer position at GreenLink. It was like, oh, maybe, maybe Is that somebody how you came in? Me. You applied as an installer? Yeah. I just, wow. I just threw my resume. I'm like, oh, maybe somebody will call me. I <laughs> yeah. can talk to somebody and. That's wild. And, uh, I that's did not recall that uh, so. <laughs> being the case. Holy smokes! Uh, yeah. Well, we're glad that uh, glad that you did reach out. Obviously, uh, and so yeah. Now within your role at GreenLink, I mean, you are uh, instrumental certainly on the design side. You're the one that's really the brains behind the uh, the operation when it comes to getting these systems prepared to be installed. And uh, and then also you do some of the field stuff as well when it gets into troubleshooting and and helping coordinate to make sure that you know the systems are performing the, the way that they're designed. Um, let's talk a little bit about, you know, some of the projects, what's a project that comes to your mind, uh, that was, you know, a unique or complex or anything that just kind of jumps out to you. Is there anything that comes to your mind? Oh yeah. We've, we've had so many. I mean, I, I think a lot of these, we, we came online, you know, we were starting to do, uh, systems where like, we're kind of pushing the limits of what, sure what they can do. I mean, yeah. The Hyder project's probably one of the biggest ones I think about. Yeah, that. that's a that was an amazing project, right? I mean, what was the it was a residential house, right? And yep. we had hundreds of panels, I think, I don't two, three hundred, like one eighty or two twenty, okay. something somewhere yeah. around the two hundred range of right. panels. And, uh, and I think we had six inverters, no, eight, eight inverters, six yep. with batteries. Okay. And the a solar edge actually had just kind of been releasing that battery. That's right. And uh, they're, you know, they know you can have like maximum like nine on a system or something, yeah. and three inverters that have batteries can be tied together. And uh, we basically had to, you know, get involved with their their engineers and be like, okay, right. so we're already kind of pushing this past the limits of what you designed yeah. it for. So yeah. what, like, what can we do with this? So yeah, I think if I recall correctly on that job too, I think our rep at Solar Edge had said that we were among the first in the country that did some sort of design or use case with that battery do you remember hearing anything about this yeah typically you'll see on a house they'll have up to you know one to three usually okay i mean you could do nine to max it out but sure. nobody really maxes it out on yeah. your average house so yeah. so we came on on there and we're like well we're gonna do six yeah and they're like i don't think anyone's done that many on one site yet sure okay so yeah they uh we actually had to uh figure out like the the communications wiring and stuff because it mm-hmm. was we kind of maxed out the wireless chips ability got it we had to go back to hardwiring for it for the communication side we had to hardwire everything together yeah between the batteries and and each of their inverters okay yeah Yeah. that's uh that was a fascinating job and uh in fact we'll pull up a photo and put that in the in the episode here to show kind of what that we got some cool drone shots we did yeah yeah Yeah, that that house and everything about that was really fascinating i mean i remember that customer had I don't know, like Bentleys or something like that in the driveway with the yeah. baby's b- booster seat in the back of it with chicken yeah. nuggets in it and stuff. I was like, wow, that's not the way. So my first Lucid parked out there. <laughs> yeah. I was like, oh, those are real. I didn't right. know they were taking yeah. deliveries. That's yeah. cool. That was uh, very interesting. Yep. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about the battery side then. I mean, because batteries is definitely the you know the direction that things keep trending towards, right? Certainly. Yeah, I think storage is going to... Right, that one to one net metering is is right. probably going to start tapering off in most areas. I think yep. California was one of the first to do it. They did. Yeah, we're probably going to follow suit. And At end of this year, yeah, actually, and, it's scheduled yeah. to go to net metering two point oh from uh, from what I understand. And what that means, like Jacob's saying, a one to one net metering is you put a kilowatt into the grid, you get a kilowatt out of the grid. Uh, that's the way that works. Yeah, I, I like to I like to tell customers that think of like a rollover minutes on like cell phone plans. Back there you in go. The, yeah, you know, the twenty tens or something. E- that's exactly kind of how it works. And with net metering two point oh, it won't quite be the same. You're going to put in a kilowatt hour, but you're going to put it in at wholesale, and then you're going to get yeah. it back at a version of retail, and so it won't be a full dollar for dollar offset. Is that yeah. A good so way to say explain that? you know like with one to one. If you sell one for ten cents, you're buying it for ten cents. Right. But now it's going to be something more like you. What you're buying at ten cents, if you send it back, you're only going to get five for it. Exactly. Something like that. So, basically, what that means for a customer is, um, it's going to be financially better for you to use your power as you're producing it. 
like on site. Don't sell it and then buy it back later in the night. Like you yeah. want to use it while you're making it. That makes sense. And, so does that kind of tie into this concept, like virtual power plants and stuff like that? Are you familiar with this concept? Yeah, yeah. Virtual power plants are kind of tangentially related to that. So sure. basically you're, say you had a, a 100 kilowatt hour battery yep. and you said, okay, I want, I mean, that'd be a big one. It'd be like a commercial one. But yeah. you say, okay, I want half of this is available to use as a virtual power plant. Mm. So utility can say, hey, we got to, you know, demand's going up. We need to bring some more power online. Yep. They can fire up like another natural gas or coal-fired peaker plant. Right. Or they can say, we have this many customers signed up that have battery available right now. Let's just tell those to start discharging. And they can instead. send that power back into the grid. Yes. And, and obviously, I mean, there's agreements between customers and utility companies. They're not going to go in and steal the juice out of your battery w- yeah. without permission and an agreement in place. Uh, but in those situations, as that becomes more... Uh, mainstream. I don't know. Is any are there any states that are doing that model yet that are fully up and running with that? I don't know state wise. I know yeah. Tesla has software that's capable of it. Got it. And, okay. and some of their customers, maybe it was in California, they can actually sign up for that. Okay. Yeah. And, and they do compensate you for whatever you oh, send for to sure. the grid. Yeah, and yeah. I think there's even some flat rate stuff you get just for being available. To, okay. To use your yeah, battery, whether or not so. they even need to pull from your battery, they're saying, "Hey, just for having this agreement in place, we're going to give you a stipend every month or whatever that looks like." Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think that's really fascinating. Back when I went to my first solar conference, this was in uh, Salt Lake City. I don't know, five, six years ago, whenever it was. Um, that was one of the big talking points of the whole expo was the virtual power plant model, and it seems to make sense to me, you know, just from the little bit I understand about it, that that is the future. I mean, that's how they avoid, like you said, firing up the peaker plants. That's a huge cost for them to fire that up for, I don't know, a couple yeah. hours or whatever. And it's duration. also not fast. Either. Right. I mean, some some type of plants spool up faster than others, but you know, sending something over the internet yeah. to tell a battery, hey, switch modes, like, right. that's a lot quicker than, say, right. oh, let's get the steam turbine going. You know? Exactly. So, yeah. yeah. No, that's a, that's a really good point. So, you know, you and I have talked a lot, a lot about this, but, you know, the difference between, you know, sticking within the batteries, you know, DC coupled versus AC coupled, what are some of the things that you see there and what's your opinion? You know, do you have a favorite between one of those two options? And Yeah, yeah, sure. So uh, basically the core of it, um, DC coupled versus AC. Mm-hmm. So AC coupled, your battery has its own inverter. Okay. So your solar panels, they either have micro inverters or they go to their own solar inverter yep. that makes AC power like you use in your house. Got it. And then to charge your batteries, the batteries will actually take that AC and convert it back to DC and charge the battery. So you okay. Have basically, two inverters like interacting with each other. Sure. So I mean, that seems like you're you're converting it twice in that scenario. Is yes. That right? Yeah. Okay. Essentially, yeah. You convert from solar, which is DC. solar DC to AC. Yep. From AC to battery DC. Yeah. And if if you want to use it, you got to go battery DC back to AC. Back to so AC. So you actually got three in there okay. for, for using it. And that would be an N phase system. Yeah, you'll see like uh, N phase um, yeah. Franklin batteries. Franklin's or, or AC, AC coupled. coupled. Okay. Yep. And um, you get some advantages to that are things like uh, you can AC couple, for example, a Franklin, it doesn't really care what kind of solar you have. It can be it. a Generac, a Fronius, a Solar Edge, yeah. Enphase. It'll, it just wants to see AC coming in and yeah. it'll charge or okay. discharge. So Got it. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and then on the DC side, obviously, I mean, I know I have, I have a Generac in my house that's DC coupled, but what are some of the you know pros and cons in your mind of a DC coupled battery? Yeah. So, so DC coupled, the difference is that the solar coming off your roof as DC, it goes directly to the battery. It doesn't get converted to AC first. Sure. Okay. So now it might go through some device to you know match the voltages or something like that, but sure. it's, it's not near as much loss as actually inverting it. Um, so the thing that makes DC coupling really cool is you get this thing called when you have oversizing, which is where you have more solar than your inverter is capable of handling. Clipping? Is that another yes, that's oversizing where clipping? Comes clipping? Into play. Okay. So say you have a... a 15 kilowatt solar array and it's maxed out it wants to make 15 yep if your inverter is only a 10 it's going to make 10 right and it can't do anything with that extra five yep now if you had a dc coupled battery the inverter can make its 10 yeah and then that extra five can go into your battery go into the storage side later right so where that that helps you is um it it makes it much more advantageous to stack up your dc side and, and really really load that up 
Sure. Because generally speaking, it's a lot cheaper to build stuff on the DC side. It's a lot more cost effective. Right. Putting panels up is easier and less expensive than it is to adding more inverters. Yes. And it's also, um, there's a lot more regulations on the AC side. So your Got utility it. may yeah. say, hey, you can only have 10 kilowatts. Right. Or, you know, your AHJ may say that, or there's different sure. interconnect agreements and things. So. Yep. And that and the, and also the AC infrastructure is a little more expensive. It's mm. bigger wires generally, and you you have to you know tie into your your main panel or wherever you're going to interconnect. Yeah, and it's, it's also a little more regulated with inspectors oh, and stuff true. too. So, so your wiring gauges would change between a 10 kilowatt inverter and a 20 kilowatt inverter when you're going from the inverter to your point of interconnection. Yes, yeah, because you're you're okay. carrying more Got power. It. Right, and, and generally sense, speaking, yeah. your DC side is going to be running at say four or five six hundred volts, or in commercial even up to a thousand. Okay. Whereas your AC is 240 volt AC in your house. Sure. So if you have the same amount, because power is amps times volts. So mm -hmm. same amount of power. Yeah. But if you have double the voltage, you need half the amps. Got which it. Which means less copper, less okay. wire, saves a lot of costs. Things sure. don't get as hot because you're not running as much current. Yep. And it's just all, all around a lot more cost effective infrastructure. Hmm. And things where as a homeowner, you can, you can say, I want to add more panels. You can add more panels. But if you want to add more inverters... You might have to go back to your interconnect agreement. See, is that allowed? Do I need to redo my interconnect paperwork with my utility? Get like, back into engineering and everything else, right? Yeah. I mean, it can be heavy duty to do that yeah. type of an expansion versus, hey, I want to squeeze a little more out of the system. I want to put six more panels on the roof. And that's an option you could go, assuming that your AC to DC ratio is within line. Though, yeah, right? within the, there are uh, there are mechanical, obviously, limits. Like, you, you sure. can't just put a, a million watts on, you know, <laughs> right. a little inverter. You'll yeah. eventually melt something. But yeah. But there are there are ratios that you can do. So I mean, sure. Commonly, you'll see 150 percent, so yep. 15 DC to like a 10 AC. Right. Um, we're seeing inverters now from SolarEdge that can do 200, and and they even have some smaller ones that do 300 percent. Wow. Is approved. Wow, that's crazy. And still warranted if you. 30 fall. kilowatts of DC power on the roof, to yeah. one 10 kilowatt AC inverter. Yeah, yeah, it's possible. Unbelievable. They're, they have yeah. a. I think it's a. Their 3.8 can take up to 11.4. Of DC power. Now, is, that really, at that that AC to DC ratio is so out of line of what I would typically see, right? At the 150%. Yeah. What's the use case in your mind? Why would anybody ever want to oversize that much? Even say 200%. Why would you want to go that far on an initial install? Yeah, basically, if the biggest reason to go that far is if you're you're limited by how much AC infrastructure you can Got it. So back to the infrastructure yeah. side, if you're prohibited there, then you try to max this thing out. Yes. Yep. Um, if your wires are already... You know, whatever size they are, you don't want to trench, you don't want to replace all that or get right. a whole service upgrade, yep. then you can max Got out the it. DC side. Okay. And the other thing is you can, um, it, it really makes sense if you're going to go down that route to look at things like adding storage or using the DC sure. directly. Yeah. So that's where you're going to see like DC car charging. I mean, there's a lot oh, of yeah, companies yeah. kind of teasing that stuff. I yep. haven't seen any hit production yet, but it's they're getting there. Okay, so Solar Edge, right? They've got their level two DC yep. charger on the way. Yes. So basically, you could think about that. Your car charger is yeah. tied to your solar. There you go. You don't need to take up any breaker space in your in your panel or anything. So you can go straight from the sun to your batteries, or straight wow. to your car, or from your batteries to your car. You that's know, pretty so you cool. Can, so that's a great example there, right? Yeah, you're limited. But you're gonna say, okay, I'm gonna oversize this thing, which there and there are state regulations right through the IPA. Yes, are, in, in Illinois, yeah. our SREC program is right now we're limited to 155 percent right. DC to AC is yep. the ratio. So, DC to AC, okay. Yeah, they they have something in there where you can apply for an exemption okay. for specific projects. We yeah. I've never gone down that route. Right. I mean, yeah, maybe maybe we could talk to them about what that would sure. look like. Yeah, but yeah, it's definitely something that we may see changing. That's fascinating future. though, to be able to, in, in that case, whatever situation to be where you would oversize that much to be able to send that excess power straight to your car battery. So if you worked from home or could time it right, you're just plugging in your car every day, you're making sure it's plugged in at 10 AM and you know, through the afternoon and you're yeah. charging that dude up with all that extra power and you're powering your house. And theoretically, I guess once your vehicle's charged and your house is satisfied, you could be sending some to your storage the battery yep. in your basement and, or wherever. And there's so many options with the software, how I want to prioritize, you know, this load first, then the batteries, yeah. or first my house batteries, then my car, but only up to this point, and then I want to sell it to the grid. That's cool. You get yeah. into really cool stuff like that, that we're, we're going to see a lot of options with that. So that's almost like a version of, well, maybe not even a version, that's just a load management feature built into the software, but not load management in the sense where I think of like the smart panel, like a span or lumen, 
but the inverter load is yeah. load, load management is that the right term? What would you call that? Yeah, I think I would call it like that. And, and the difference there's there's two types. There's proactive and then there's reactive management. Okay. So reactive is like, hey, the power went out. I'm on my battery now, but my battery can't run my air conditioner. Otherwise, you know, I'm right. going to back up my house for like an hour instead yeah. of all night. Yep. So you turn off the air conditioner. Okay. Proactive is stuff like I I know I have this extra power, so I want to like. I want to use the loads when I have the extra power. So like you're, mm-hmm. you're doing it. I'm trying to think of what to describe it. Yeah. You're like proactive. So it's like, I know yeah. I'm going to have this power. Let's not yeah. charge the battery up yet. Cause I know I'm going to have more later. Right. Yeah. Let's not it charge on. it off the grid at midnight. Cause I know yeah. that I'm going to have something coming in at, you know, 10 AM. Yeah, you know, you're going to have a speed. surplus so you can allocate that to things before sure. it's even occurred. And then got it. So like it, in that scenario that I'm talking about with the charge in the EV, you would program into the system to say, I'm going to have my car plugged in but I don't want to send any power to it until this time of day, then start sending yeah. power. Is you that can go by time of day or excess solar is what we're seeing too. Okay. Yeah, that makes so sense. Yeah. say you're making five kilowatts, your house is using two, you can send that extra three to the grid or you can have Point the car charger throttled to match whatever that excess amount you would have sent to the grid is. Wow. And it'll, yeah. it'll change. So it can be sending, you know, three kilowatts to your car. And then if you, Solar kicks up, the clouds go away. Now sure. it's like, okay, we'll send more to the car, and it can throttle up and down yeah. to match that load. Very cool, very cool. Just, so that starts to get me thinking, too, about a project we recently did up in, uh, what, north of Madison, a big project up there where we did batteries and yeah, generators. Real cool cabin and stuff up there. Yeah. I'm, I'm interested to you know pick your brain a little bit about that and hear some of the things about you know how that system was configured, right? Because I'm saying we had the solar, we had batteries, we had generators; they were already existing. Yeah, just this, this ecosystem of power production and the grid. You had the gas and the electric and all the other things. How you know? How did we design that system? How did we implement that? And I know you spent a lot of time talking to the customer about different configurations. Yeah. There, it's right in the same so vein. W- whenever you're doing a backup system, it's important to really like setting expectations is yeah. is very important for at sure that, at that stage because. You want to make it clear, like, okay, some some things can be powered off grid, and some things are it's just not practical. Right. So, like this customer, for example, had several uh, geothermal units. Yeah. And this this is a big house. I mean, it was it's built kind of like like a small hotel would be. Right. Right. So, yeah. so even our our batteries maxed out. Like they're they're not going to have enough starting amps to fire up one or two of these geothermal units at the mm. same time. So, that's where you know, he luckily they had a generator on site. So they had already kind of grouped the loads that they wanted, like sure. lights, internet, security cameras. Yeah. You can even have a lot of your outlets and things like sure. that, maybe your well, some pumps. Yep. So that was kind of already set aside. So we went over those loads and we allowed one of the EV chargers was allowed to still be hooked up. So one of his EV chargers? Yes, yeah, he had one in the garage of the I E1. didn't realize so, he had EV chargers up there. Yeah, there was okay. there was one up there and and we're like, okay, Leo, you might have to throttle this back, but you can run this off grid depending on other situations. So that's where like Got load it. management would be kind of critical. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. So in that case with that with that EV charger, he obviously didn't have the level two Solar Edge EV charger because they're not out yet. Um, yeah, it was an existing one. So. Right. If he ever replaced that to a level two Solar Edge EV charger with this system that we have at his house. Would he also be able to use his EV battery to backfeed into the house under certain scenarios to add more uh, resiliency? The uh, the level two one is not that that okay. one's just charging the car. Got it. And you can do stuff like charge off excess solar or yeah. change the charge rate up and down, set sure. schedules based on the time of day and all that. Mm-hmm. Um, but that that one is not the bi directional one. Bi directional is the word. Yeah, bi directional, okay. so meaning it can charge the car and the car can charge the house. Yeah. Basically. So okay. that will be. That's that's a DC coupled one. That's also through Solar Edge, and that's been rumored okay. to hopefully end of twenty twenty four, early twenty twenty five. So, sure, I see yeah. some companies are you know like the Ford Lightning, and they've partnered with I think Sunrun or somebody, uh, where they seeming they're selling that with a bi directional meter. Are they not? Yeah, the the Lightning is capable of bi directional, and it's a proprietary thing from Ford. Got it. So it's actually more yeah. built into the EV. Giving it the bi-directional capabilities. Yeah, that that I'm not sure. I've been trying to find spec sheets on that because okay. there's somewhere you can take where where you take the DC from the car, turn it into AC in another device, and then send it to the house. Okay. And there's some vehicles like uh, actually the Lightning Two has outlets in the bed where it's making the AC on board the vehicle. Sure. So there's some then, kind of inverter in there yeah. somewhere then. Right? Yeah. So there's okay. there's a lot of that. I, I think eventually there'll be a standard, but it's gonna be sure. interesting to see how this. Yeah, plays you out. told me a little bit about that too. Yeah. So, so right now, from what you know, though, 
that bi-directional feature that they're selling with the lightning and the sunrun package is not necessarily an you know a third party charging product it's actually something between the truck and some kind of transfer switch that sun runs yeah it sounds like they have their own kind of transfer switch thing the whole because it's got to isolate from the from the grid you don't want to backfeed exactly the lines and and hurt somebody working on a transformer so there there has to be a you know ul rated switch wow okay so I, i don't know how or if that plays with other solar systems right but um it's like the hardware can do it. It's just right. a matter of figuring out what brands are going to work together, how sure. they're going to communicate, and uh, what that would look like from a, a customer interface. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Wow. I didn't know that. So, I didn't realize that that was a proprietary thing. I figured they're just using somebody's third party charger and you know, kind of co- you know, white labeling it or something like that. Yeah, but, I think you had to get it through Ford, and I don't know if okay. anybody else could install it or if it was like exclusive to SunPower. I'm, I'm not 100 sure, gotta, but I, I've been digging off. for stuff on it, and I yeah, they seemed like they had a lot of that was proprietary. So okay, you and I have talked about you know, I had exploring you know the Ford Lightning or an electric truck someday, <laughs> uh, but I can't do that until Greenlink can be the installer because I'm not going to have Sunrun install <laughs> the <Yeah>. EV charger <laughs> in my house. So, uh, Okay, so I kind of rabbit trailed us there. So you're talking, we were talking about the the project up north. You were at his EV charger, and that kind of rabbit trailed uh, some thoughts in my head there. But um, you know, we also had what we broke that system into two systems, right? We had his like guest house and his main cabin. Yeah, there were two separate buildings, and now if you had one building that was being fed off of another building, then I would have done one system. But this was right. two completely separate electrical services yeah so totally different meters totally yep. different main service panels right yep so so we had a building that had the solar on it and that was just an outbuilding i think it was like 800 feet across the property we actually right. had to get some wire out there and that yeah. was that was quite an ordeal <laughs> it was yeah yeah i saw the i wasn't ever up there but i saw the photos and it looked uh, yep. intense yep so so that building half the panels on the building or more like two thirds of them are going to the bigger cabin okay. and the other the other portion of the panels are powering the guest cabin got it so okay. that's how we split that up. We brought brought our DC to the building where all the inverters and batteries are. Mm-hmm. So they're all there communicating. All in one site, the ba- the inverters and batteries were all in the guest house? Yes, yeah, they were all in the guest house. Got it, okay. So then from there, the mm-hmm. AC power for the guest house could just stay in the guest house. We were already right there. Yeah. The AC power for the cabin, that had to be another, another um, board. You know, trenched wire, yeah, yeah. board wire, yep, all the way up to the, the main cabin got it okay so all our conversions and everything were happening in the guest house okay interesting so, yeah i guess yeah. i didn't uh didn't recall that either um, uh, yeah finding place for the batteries that was that was really what the customer preferred i do remember that and yeah, that's we, another yeah. thing too is component placement you know because sure you want five batteries well okay do you have Where's a wall to mount them on where are we putting them yeah and they can't go outside necessarily right where, where we live not in, in our Midwest. climate yeah. right yeah not really best to have them in the cold so out yeah. down south though, where they don't obviously have the the cold like we do, it's very common that they're putting the batteries outside. At least from the photos I see on yeah, on yeah, some of the installers. they're more concerned with the heat down there. So you put them right. on the north side of a building, okay, they, they stay out of the sun, and yeah, then they're not getting like it just makes sense. Yeah, you don't want that heat. south side where it's just beaming yeah. on those batteries all day. It can't yeah. be, would then not be good. You know, in places like Texas, it's very it's very easy. You can have the batteries outside. Yeah, and some HJs might even require that. Right. Depending yeah. On, yeah. That as, makes sense. As yeah. the codes are updated to sure, you know, to catch up to where the tech is too. Yeah. So. Yeah. I can see that. So that's some of the hardware side, and then on the software side on that job, uh, I recall after it was done, the customer was like, "Hey, you know, I want this kind of sequencing to happen. If a grid outage, I want this to happen first, and this to happen second. Can you walk us through some of what that that conversation yeah. was, and some of the steps that you took to make sure that he was happy with how the operate that system operated? Yeah, so what's really cool is be, because he had a generator existing on site, yep. um, one of the things we did is we we actually kind of left that system how it was, but yep. we put our solar transfer switch before that, so upstream of it. Okay. So basically, ah. um, as it's happening, our, our sun's powering the loads, yep. anything extra is going to the batteries. Right. When the power goes out, the batteries and the solar are going to work together. Yeah. to power the house so that generator is still thinking there's power there right yeah as far point. as the generator is concerned the grid's still up nothing's yeah, happened right so and, and that transfer switch is fast enough on our solar side that it doesn't really know it can catch it yeah. yep so it thinks the power's up if it's mm-hmm. nighttime you're mm-hmm. not gonna have the solar but you will have the batteries right and if the batteries run out of juice or hit their emergency you know threshold yep then that transfer switch will it'll lose power and okay. as far as the generator is concerned, it's a regular outage. It'll pick back up, and power it. everything the way it was before we even had solar. Right. So, right. So, really, at the end of it, and I, I think I do recall hearing this, 
the generator was just totally unaffected by what we did there because you installed it yep. upstream from the generator. It's just like, hey, it's already there. This is great. We just need to make sure everybody's playing nicely and we don't need to mess with anything. Yep. Yeah. So luckily, so for that situation, by wiring it that way, we don't need our solar app to communicate with the generator. We don't yeah. need to make sure that two company software works together. Right. It's That's just great. The yeah. grids, as far as the generator is concerned, the power is on or it's off. Right. And that's Simple all as that. to know. Yep. And, and that's a really cool thing about you know the value. One of many things, the value that you bring to what we're doing at GreenLink uh, is, you know, it's not cookie cutter, right? With these systems, it's not just, hey, we're going to go put on a solar system and run the wires and we're done. And it's not always that simple. And in fact, in a lot of cases, I'd say it's probably not that simple, right? Yeah, uh, it's, it's every, it's part of the reason I like residential so much is that every system is a puzzle. It, yeah. It's got something it's going very on. It's unique, right? And yeah, it's like, all right, if, if this was my house, how would I set it up? And that's kind of how I like to approach every project. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Walk walk me through that a little bit. Like, so you know, we go through the sales process, and you know, at GreenLink, when we talk to a customer, we're using Aurora. Obviously, is our design software, which is a state of the art software, to give the absolute best modeling we can. But during the sales process, you're not 100 percent optimizing every single aspect because you do many many quotes, and you might only have one person purchase a system. So you got to be careful on how much design and engineering goes on the front end. But once it hits your desk, what happens? What are you doing? Yeah. So basically. It, like like any really engineering problem, it's first okay. What what do we know? You know what mm. what size service do they have? Yep. How many panels are they wanting? Like yep. you know how much of their bill are we expecting to like be able to compensate for? Are we backing things up? If so, what are we backing up? What yeah. what should we not back up and and load shed? Sure. So basically, we're we're just gathering all the information, and that's that's part of the site survey process, and part of uh, talking to the customer, figure out what what their expectations are and what's yep. been set. And then, then from there, uh, we go on. We go with the, 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 the hardware that we've spec'd out. It's like, all right. So, what is what is feasible with this? Like, how many panels do you want to put on? Mm. Is there multiple inverters? Do we want to split the panels evenly between two? Sure. Or some of them are south. Some of them are like east-west. Maybe we can load up the east-west a little higher. Right. Like, so you're thinking of the orientation yeah. on a dual inverter system. You're thinking yeah. about how am I going to evenly send power, or maximize the way this is being sent throughout yeah. the system. Yep. Yeah. Basically, trying trying to balance everything. Sure. So it's actually you know, working very well. And if, say, you have one inverter's got batteries, the other does not, you mm -hmm. can, you can do that. That's one of the combinations you can do. But the one with the battery, you may want to load that one up higher because it's got storage. Yeah. So that makes you know, sense. there's there's no real downsides to clipping. If sure. You can, you can load it up, and that clipped energy is just going to go into the battery. So yeah. You're thinking about about that, and then if there's going to be chargers for cars, you know, maybe. Are we close to the garage already? We can tie some of these right into the inverter. Sure. It saves us a wiring run, makes yeah. it easier to install, looks looks cleaner. Right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, the cosmetics is, is a part of it too. Obviously, functionality and performance is, is really number one, but cosmetics is not lost on us, right? And we're always trying yeah. to be thoughtful about our conduit runs. I'm sure everybody you know out there has seen it. We're some systems that cosmetically is not as yeah, much of a concern. Zigzagging for across the roof, you know, <laughs> yeah. like, yeah, we try yeah. to keep everything kind of grouped together. Yeah. You know, it's like if we can have just the array just be like just a nice block of panels. Right. Like That's that looks nice. really clean. Absolutely. And try to avoid just like a, a little diagonal panel sitting by itself and stuff sure. like that's kind of it. Not only does it take more hardware to install stuff like that. Yeah. Because it needs its own junction box, its own set of wires. Right. It's. Yep. It's better all around materials wise, cost wise, just yeah. ease of install. Right. To just kind of optimize everything. Yeah. Optimizing, I think that's a big word. Uh, one of our big projects that we're working on right now at the Rockford University, um, you know, you took and you went through that, we'll call it the Jacob optimization process. Right. And, yeah. uh, you know, from what I recall, I mean, you took the same number of panels that we had from our initial, you know, kind of we'll say sales design, and you started doing your magic and working through there. And I think you were able to squeeze out an extra, I don't know how many hour, you know, kilowatt hours of production. It was significant. Yeah, yeah, we were, were we like about a thousand, like one fifty or something? Yeah. kilowatt hours that you got extra out of that. And oh, I got from from thousand one fifty to like one thousand one sixty something. So okay, got it. Another little one, bit out of that. one million probably, right? Yeah, we were we were that that was uh, no, yeah, no, yeah, one million kilowatt hours. We're in the yeah, yeah, yeah we're yeah. in the. It's actually gigawatt hours. I okay. Think, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so you got a nice, <laughs> you got a nice but... extra bit of production out of that system just by really working through that optimization, yeah, your and, stringing, your orientations. And that was a good example of where that was a system where we were, we were maxed out on our AC side. 
Right. So like the buildings okay. we were tying into, we could only fit so many inverters there because sure. say it's an 800 amp service, we can't hook 1200 amps to that. Got building. it. We can yeah. only hook so You're much You're capped up. out on so, the AC side. So we're capped out. So now it's like, well, it's a great this point. is the max yeah. amount of panels we can put here. Yep. Anything else has to go on the other buildings. And sure. Then you just go through building by building. Until you run out of panels, and get it all leveled out. Hopefully, you can fit them all. Yeah, <laughs> so, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. That's uh, that's an exciting uh, project for us. And as we, you know, continue to work through that, we're in the early stages right now. Right, we're getting ready to get our final bit of engineering and stamps on that. I think you were doing your final revisions today, from what I understand. Oh yeah, lots. Of, it's a pretty long file. So. <laughs> yeah, I imagine <laughs> that. I imagine it would be. It's a it's a big project. Our our biggest project yet at GreenLink. And uh, what's exciting about that is we've got the team for it. You know, having you obviously your key for that. Dave and Brian and all everybody involved in that. I mean, it takes our whole team. And if we would have had that project, you know, five or six years ago, we would have said, hey, this is not for us. Uh, we would not have been prepared. Yeah, yeah really growing the team to the point where we can take something on like that is yeah. really cool. Take it on and take and confidently too, which is which is yeah. really exciting. I mean, we're I mean even, at, and, even at this level, you know, we were going through the buildings with our electricians, with Dave, right? Yeah. We're, we're going through and like, all right, like this is what we're tying into yeah. we got to find parts for this and right. uh, we got people right now that are, are sourcing parts Chasing we're going to need and, and lining it up some of this commercial size stuff there's going to be lead times on it but sure. we already have people on that sourcing yeah. it before we've even yeah you know, way in advance of the project yeah, so, yeah that's a yeah it's, it's a nice good feeling. to run like that so. for sure yeah i remember some of the green links earlier projects you know <laughs> in the beginning um that would just there would be a lot of stress for me because it was new territory and a new team and we were building this thing and you know we always worked very 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 diligently to make sure that it was always 110 percent of what it could be you know as far as the performance of the system and, and integrity of the system but still a lot of stress nonetheless but again yeah now, i mean you know some of the stuff we're installing like the instruction manuals for it were designed for like europe or something so it's like <laughs> right, all right well yeah. <laughs> i think i know how this works exactly. but i don't know if anybody's There's, done this yet exactly. so we got some kinda, challenges yeah in, we got to work with the, with the manufacturer and yeah figure out, like okay this is what we're trying to do and yeah. like i think it's capable of it like how right. do we hook it up and yeah we figure all that out so yeah. and that's really cool too to be able to have those resources i know on Rockford University, I mean, you were working with Solar Edge's engineering team, right? Or yeah, with their having, applications engineers yeah. directly. I mean, how great is and that? Just to be able to have that validation throughout that design phase. You know, we've got multiple layers that we're hitting this on to ensure this system is going to do what we say it's going to do. Yep. And that's a that's a great thing. But yeah, because it's it's a lot a lot of a lot of requirements. You got the, what the hardware can do. You got yeah. what the code is allowing. You got what the customer wants. Right. And you know you gotta you gotta Blending find the balance together. between all of it. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Well, cool, man. I'm glad uh, glad we got a chance to talk together today. And I think uh, we've definitely got several more episodes that we'll have to do throughout the year because there's a lot more to talk about. Uh, but I think that was a good oh, first yeah. run and some really good, <laughs> exciting stuff there. So yeah. thanks for uh, thanks for joining today. Yeah, glad to be on. Thanks for having me.